Well, hello there. And this is Auntie. And I am here to do my review of Evil Lives Here, Season 1, Episode 2, My Brother's Season. Everybody needs a sweet old auntie. Everybody needs. With a whoop whoop and a boop boop. Auntie, that's why everybody You can make this up. Now you know that these are some crazy motherfuckers. So why even sweet old Are you okay? Are you okay? Hi everybody. Have you ever heard the story of the little boy? Or the little girl who cried wolf. It told so many lies that when they told the truth, it was absolutely unbelievable. But this is a twisted version of that story. Danielle White grew up in a home with her sister, Maureen, and her brother, Richard. Danielle decided that she wanted to recall and talk about the story of her brother. Richard Paul White, born October the 29th of 1972, to a mom who was divorced, right? Okay. So, as they grew up, Danielle, Maureen, and her brother Richard, they grew up extremely poor. Her mother decided to divorce her husband and to get involved with another man. That man was an alcoholic, okay, to say the least. They grew up as happy little kids before this man came into their life. And then after he came into their life, everything went sour. Danielle does not recall, neither talks about her childhood. In episode two, season one, Evil Lives Here. But her sister Maureen decided that she too would take to television to tell her version of the story. Some of which you're going to be hearing from me will be Maureen recalling, not Danielle. Because in my opinion, I believe that Danielle is still in denial. But anyway, let's go on. So Maureen recalls their childhood and talks about the things that they went through. She says she doesn't remember one day where her brother wasn't her hero. Maureen indicated that they grew up in the home together with a mother who was an alcoholic, who hooked up with their stepdad, who was an alcoholic. So you can imagine the life these children grew up in, not only was Richard's, Daniel's, and Maureen's stepfather an alcoholic, but he was also abusive. They watched countless nights as her mother and her stepfather would come into the house late at night drunk from a binge of just hanging out drinking and partying and clubbing and doing whatever they do with the woo woo. 
and the boo goo goo. After a while, the 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 things that the father was doing to the stepfather was doing to the mother began to be done to the children. They watched as their mother was dragged through the house and bloody nose and all that kind of stuff, all that gory stuff that you can't even imagine going through as a child. They watched their mother go through that. Many nights they would hear him in the room with her and they would hear thump after thump after thump. They wanted to make it go away, but they couldn't make it go away because no matter what they said to mommy, mommy loved this man and wanted to be with him. Oh, yes, she did. At the expense of her children. Because not only was he putting them paws on mommy, he began to put the paws on the kids. Now, this family was very poor. There were many times that they would live from pit of the post because stepdaddy was a bit of a rebel, if you will. He would do little small petty crimes and things like that, and it will cause them to have to move every time he was arrested or his name came up in the paper or allegedly a store was broken into or two. And so these children found themselves oftentimes living in their car with their stepfather and their mother. And it didn't make a difference what happened in the household. Mama was not going to, according to Maureen, ever take their side. One time, some things happened with the kids and they decided that they were going to separate them. Richard was the first one to leave out of the house because Richard had made a decision that he was not going to get his ass whooped anymore. He was going to buck back. According to Maureen, although he bucked back, he stood his ground against his daddy. He didn't win. But daddy damn sure knew he was there. And so Richard decided to pack his bags and go and live with his biological father. So did Danielle, the one that's sitting behind me. But they left Maureen. And so all the things that they were all taking from this, you know, this guy, Maureen, began to experience these things on her own. But her brother and her sister escaped it, at least for a while. Maureen indicated that while she was in the house with her father, that she became pregnant. And then she ended up having a miscarriage. Now, all Maureen did was go back and forth to school, right? So, who could she possibly be pregnant by? Maureen eventually went to authority. She went to school. And she was dropped off. And they were telling her that she had to go back home. Because Maureen had eventually left home. And she said that when they were telling her to go back home, she said, I'm not going back home. I'm not being treated the way that a child should be treated. And so, of course, the authorities came in and began to communicate with Maureen about what was going on with her as a child. Later, charges were pressed against their stepfather. And then there was a trial. Because Maureen was a, a juvenile, she began to, you know, she did not even want to be in the courtroom with him because just the very sight of him sickened her. Maureen ended up filing charges against them. And there was a trial, as I said. And Maureen's mother took the side of her husband. And the case was thrown out because she indicated, according to Maureen, that she was lying. Horrible, right? 
Maureen recounted oftentimes that, you know, back in the day, because they were on food stamps, when the mother would get the food stamps, she would send them to the store to go and get little um, a penny candy just so they could make change off the food stamps. Because back in the day, for all of y'all that don't know, food stamps used to be food stamps. They came in a little coupon book. It didn't come on a card that you swipe at the damn grocery store. Oh, no. So they had to go in and get penny candy so they could bring them the, the change back. And, and, and so they can get drunk and party all night. She said that their worst fear was being hungry. But it soon became their reality. Oftentimes, Richard would go to the store and do little petty crimes and steal chocolate candy and so on and so forth just so they could eat. And although the chocolate candy did not make them full, this full, this is all that they had. Because the parents made sure that they got their beer. A cook or by cook or by neglecting those kids, they made sure that they got babies. Richard and his sisters began to start going to a church together. This at this church, this was a Pentecostal church, and people were shouting and screaming and all that kind of stuff. And they were talking about demons and angels and the like. And Richard being a young guy, not being able to have or not really having any type of parental guidance or instruction or someone to go home and talk to, started learning about church. But the only thing, according to Maureen, that he learned about was the evils of the church. Now, Richard, being a young boy with no parental um, guidance and seeing all the things that was happening in his home and experiencing a lot of it for himself, Richard believed that he had a demon. He believed that he was evil and that evil lived in him. There was a scripture that Richard got out of it. And he only got the evil stuff out of these scriptures. One scripture that Richard lived by from the day that he heard it till the day of the incident was Matthew 18 and 20. For where two or three are established in my name, or assembled in my name. There I am in the midst of them. Whenever two or three of you come together in my name, I am there with you. Now, Richard, having gone through all the stuff that he was going through, he could not um, understand what was happening and he couldn't understand any of that. But he was convinced that he was evil and that he had a demon. When they became, got older, he started soliciting help from his sister, Danielle, who he was extremely close with. They would get together and have great times together as, as teenagers. And he was always the one who supported him. Maureen said he was the one that told me how to ride a bike and he was the one who taught me how to curse and he was the one who defended me no matter what happened to me he was my brother he was the one that i ran to he was the only father that i ever knew so maureen was you know separated again from danielle and and then they all because they all began to grow up but richard was always Daniel recalls a story quite different from her sister, yet still the same. 
Daniel indicated that he too was the father that she never had, the father she never known. Although the two of them had the opportunity to live with their dad, I don't understand, but okay, I digress. Here we go. So she talks about looking at the television. One night, just chilling at home, looking at TV. And she notices on the news that they are in their backyard and they are hunting and searching. And she said, wait a minute, hold up. It's my damn brother's. Wait a minute. That's my brother's home. What the hell is going on? I know that that looks like my brother's home. Now, she recalls her childhood with Richard. She said he was always peculiar, 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 and just a, a, a jokester. That's what he was. He was just a jokester. He always played all kinds of games, but they indicated that when Richard would go to fuck off, Richard went to fuck off. And they said quickly, he went from one to a thousand very, very quickly. But she was just his silly old brother. Because when they had to good times, they had good times. She said oftentimes they would move from pillar to post with just the things that they could gather. They would move so much that they would leave animals and clothes and everything because old stepdaddy, as I said, was a rebel in every town he lived in. And so Richard began to play pranks on his sisters and everything, and Danielle recalled an incident where she had a parakeet. She loved that parakeet. She, you know, she played with it all the time. It was her pet. She said one day as they were getting ready for school that morning, Richard decided that he wanted to pull a prank. He said, hey, Danielle, watch this. He takes the pigeon, puts it in his hand, snaps his snack, and feeds it to the cat. Danielle said that she screamed and she yelled out in terror that her brother would do something like that and hurt her like that. She couldn't understand why he did it. And he said, I did it because I wanted you to fail your test at school today. That was the kind of brother that they saw as a father figure. Can you imagine? Hell no, I can't imagine having my brother snap my pet and kill it and feed it to the cat, bitch. As they began to get older and everything and they were living separate, Danielle and um, um, Danielle and Richard still remain very close. This was a picture of Richard with no teeth in his mouth. Okay, but he was her brother. She said that she one day got a telephone call from her sister Maureen and said, I need you to sit down. She said, well, bitch, sit down. She said, I got to tell you something serious. She said, okay. She said, Richard just told me that he has HIV. She said she was devastated. She cried because at that time in 19, in the 70s, we didn't really know a lot about it. There wasn't any medication out there. And all she thought about is that her brother was going to be dying and being tormented as he died. She said one day that Richard came over to the house, maybe a couple of months afterwards, and she said, hey, Richard, how's the medicine? Do you have any medicine? How are you doing on the medicine? And Richard said, what medicine? She said, the medicine for your HIV. He said, I don't have HIV. She said, there was also a time during this time period that Richard made a decision that he had to go to a friend's house and then he had to travel, you know, out of state for a funeral for a friend. And she gave him the money to go and travel. And a couple of months later, she saw his friend at the store, bitch. 
Remember I asked you, do you remember the story of the little boy who cried wolf? Richard, according to Danielle, was notorious for telling lies. She said that she would often go over and play cards with him and they would have time that they would spend together and Richard doing those conversations would discuss with her that he had a, a, a desire to kill people. She said that oftentimes he would sit there and he says, sis, you know, I've killed someone, a woman. She said because he lied so much, she thought it was just a joke. And so she would sit and let him entertain her with these stories. She said that he would often talk about how he would uh, attack these women and, and, and strangle them with belts and, and use different things, you know, to, to, to harm these women. But because her brother had lied about multiple things before, she said, mm, he's just lying. It's just a joke. She said that he began to tell these stories to everybody in the neighborhood. Anybody who would listen. That's who Richard decided that he wanted to talk to. Now, this is Richard. The Richard she saw as a father figure. Check that out. This was the man. She said oftentimes he would just sit and tell her all kinds of stories about what he had done to other people. Yeah, they were just, you know, everything was fun and games and, and all that kind of stuff with the two of them. And they would just, you know, kiki and kaka and do what they do. Because after all, this was her father figure. So one day, she said that, you know, his girlfriend came to her and said, you know what, I need to ask you a question. Richard has been telling me lately about these women that he has been harming. These, these very graphic, detailed stories about women that he has hurt. He is alleging that he has killed them. She said, girl, he lying. He is lying, girl. He's been lying since he was a kid, child. Let me tell you about all the stuff that he's been lying about. So the girlfriend decides to stay in a relationship with him. But later on, she decided, I don't know if it was instinct or what it was. She wanted to be done with him. The next thing you know, the girlfriend is running frantically screaming, yelling, hollering, hollering and screaming and yelling. He's coming to get me. They run, she runs into the bathroom. Danielle runs into the bathroom behind her. Of course, the two of them are scared to death. They have no idea what is going on? The girlfriend is so frantic, she can't even communicate what it is that she has to say. She's like, oh my God, he's out to get me. He said he's going to kill me. So the two of them barricade the bathroom door and he's outside. Come out. He's banging on the door. Come out. Come out. Come out now. Let her out. So she, Danielle is yelling and saying, oh, my God, get away from the door. You're scaring us. You're scaring us. He don't give a damn. He don't care. He doesn't care. All he wants is for her to come out that bathroom. Danielle indicates that they took cover and that they held themselves in that bathroom for two hours and he never left the door he was frantic and wanted her out of there he yelled through the door she said that she wanted to be over let it be over let's make it be over 
So after two hours of standing there, she said it was time for her to go. All she wanted to do was get out of that bathroom. But Danielle, it was your ass that told her that he... Okay, anyway. So eventually she gets up. She walks to the door. She opens up the door. And there he is. Standing with a handgun in his hand. Pointing it directly at her. Danielle tries to talk to him about, um, you know, letting them go and what's wrong with him and trying to get him to snap out of this seemingly trance that he found himself in. He said, okay, well, if I don't get y'all, I'm going to get myself. She said that she had to think on a drop of a dime what to say. She said, let me tell you something, Richard. If you hurt yourself and my kids come home from school, they will never be able to unsee what you did. She said that she knew Richard and Richard loved her kids and he would never, ever, 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 ever do anything to hurt her kids. And so Richard takes the gun and he drops it on the floor. So now she's like, okay, my brother's cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. So now, bitch, you believe in some things. Okay. But still, yeah, Richard is continuing to tell them different story. And he's, you know, they say when he's really high, he's high. When he's low, he's low. So one day, Danielle was laying in bed and she got a telephone call. She was like, oh, my God, who's calling me? So she answers the phone. Hello? Sis, oh my God. Sis, you got to help me. Well, what's going on? Um, I just accidentally shot my friend. What do you mean you shot my friend? I killed him accidentally. We were trying to clean the guns. And the gun went off and I accidentally, I accidentally shot him and I need you to come and get me. Okay. All right. Oh my God. Richard. Oh my God. Come and get you. I need to go and hide. I need to hide in the woods. I need you to hide me away. She's like, oh my God. Okay. All right. I'll be there. She gets her ass out of her bed. She goes to her brother indicates that he accidentally shot his best friend. She helps him gather his bags, takes him to a store, allegedly helps him gather gear for camping. She takes him out to a park to dump him off. She's in the woods with her brother who was telling her that he accidentally killed somebody instead of her calling the police, letting law enforcement know that something has happened and her brother needs help. She assists him in hiding in the woods. So they take a long drive up to the woods and she, you know, wants to make sure that, you know, her brother's okay and, and all that kind of stuff. And just one second, y'all. I've got to set this up. Can you walk in here? So she goes into the woods. She's like, oh my God, you're going to be okay? He's like, yeah. Can you pick me up tomorrow and um, bring me some more food? She says, sure. 
since you sure you coming back and picking me up tomorrow and bringing me more food? She said, yeah. She said, as she turned to walk away, now I'm hoping this works. She said, as she turned and walked away, she heard this. Did y'all hear that? She heard this. She said, I know that that was him cocking a gun. Of course, now he's standing behind her. This is the mofo that called and woke her ass up and told her that he needed to hide his ass in the woods. The person she got up out the bed for, the person she took to the shop to go and get the stuff and the groceries and the food. And she hears a gun cock behind her again. She freezes. He's behind her. And her heart is beating. And her mind is saying, Think, think. Look at yourself. You heard it. Look at yourself. She turned around. She said, You know, I've got to go and get the kids. The kids are probably waiting for me, but I promise you I'll be back tomorrow. Jesus, okay. She slowly walks away. She said, to this day, he says that he didn't cock that gun. That bitch, he, st- he stepped on a, uh, on a damn. <laughs> he stepped on a damn stick. It's a whole big difference between stepping on a stick and cocking a gun. She gets the, out of that mother as fast as she can. She gets home. The next day, she's sitting there, she's chilling. And she sees on the television that Richard's best friend, death is on the news. And that they believe that it was a suicide. So she was like, wait a minute, hold on. Now, my brother just told me he accidentally did this. How in the hell is the newspaper or the detectives believing that he committed suicide? What will his fucking family think? What happened was his best friend, when Christopher was living in his home, he ended up getting evicted. Because, of course, he had issues. His friend allowed him to move into his home, even helped him to get a job where he was working at, gave him a glowing reference, made sure that he ate, he drank, he pooped, and did all of that. Now, Richard decides that he's going to rob his best friend and shoots him point blank in his face. And tells his sister that he, they were cleaning the guns and it accidentally went off. So now Danielle, armed with the information that she's got, has to make a decision on whether or not this family believes that their cousin, friend, uncle, brother committed suicide. They yell shaking, knowing that this would be one of the biggest decisions that she would ever have to make in her life. Call the detective on fire. Hi. I would like to speak to Detective No No Good. Detective No No Good. Thank you. I'll hold. Hi, detective. Hi. Um, my name is Daniel White, um, and I wanted to call. Um, um, you all have mentioned um, that you have an invest, uh, open investigation about a death of Chris. 
from. It wasn't a suicide. My brother called me and told me that he he accidentally killed him. That they were cleaning their guns and that he accidentally killed him. And I can't, knowing this information, I can't um, let everybody um, think, his family, his friends, anybody think that he did this to himself. He absolutely didn't do it. But it was a manhunt out for Richard. And guess who was the one that gave him up? Told his location. Danielle. So now Danielle is hated amongst the family. Everybody's thinking that Danielle is a yacht for turning her brother in, who was the father, the only father that they ever knew. And so Danielle has to walk around with the stress of knowing that she is hated amongst friends and family because nobody believes he did it. But then Richard, smart ass Richard, decides that when he goes to jail, he's got a little bit more confession that he needs to make. Richard confesses that he has killed many women. Six women to be exact. And that two of those women are buried in his backyard. Now these have been the same stories Richard had been telling his family over, over, over again. And they didn't believe him. And guess what? Neither did the detectives. Richard went over and over and told them over and over and over and over, bitch, and over and over and over. Until finally they said, okay, Richard, we're going to go to your home just to shut you up. Of course, while they leave to go to the home, Richard is still under the surveillance cameras. He said, wait till they find them prostitutes in my backyard. The detectives go over. And Richard's backyard is as he described it. There are two bodies laying in his backyard. He took one of them and dropped them into the hole. Standing straight up and covered it with concrete. And the other one, he attempted to bury. Richard had confessed to two murders for bodies that they found. There was another young woman who was a prostitute that Richard murdered. He took her body and he dumped it at his father's home on his property in Colorado. He had left the body there to decompose. He thought that if I leave the body out here at my, on my father's property, that animals would get it and gather the bones and take the bones and scatter them from here to there. But what he didn't understand was he didn't. That is not what happened. The body was intact when they got it off his father's property. There were other women that he confessed to murdering, but the bodies were never recovered. So, of course, Richard was never charged for the murders. They went back and asked Richard, why did he do this? And Richard indicated that they were prostitutes. And nobody cared about them. They were nothing. He said that he knew that he was evil. And that he would take them. And he would play the strangling game. He would torment them for up to 24, 27 hours. Constantly. He would choke them out to the point where they would be unconscious. And then would wait for them to wake back up and to torture them more. But because he had a relationship with God. And because the Bible says... In Matthews 18 and 20, 
For when two or three are assembled in my name, there I am in the midst of them. However, two or three of you came together in my name, I'm there with you. So Richard, being the serial killer that he was, before offing these women, Richard would pray with them. Richard would actually hold Bible study. He wanted to know about their past, if they had kids, their family lives. He wanted to know all the information about them. And then he would get down on his knees and pray with them because he believed two people was there praying together god would hear their prayers there were some women that richard let go oh yes he did now richard let some of them go and they came and testified against him richard got two life sentences Plus another 114 years for the heinous things that he did to these women. The sister Danielle said that when she looked at the news and saw that they were going in her brother's backyard, she remembered that this, oh my God, this is my this is my brother's house. What are they doing? She said, How could she have known that her brother? had done these crimes how could she have known with all the lying that he told how could she have known that her brother was capable of doing something like this what do you mean danielle check the backyard danielle and maureen talked about having cookouts and barbecues back there and if my brother had told me bitch that he was doing stuff like that, I would be out that cotton freaking thing with one of them little metal things you'd be thinking I'm looking for coins. Well, Danielle was the catalyst for them finding him. She also, in my opinion, covered this up. Because of the ridicule that she received, she ended up leaving the state. But Danielle, you can't leave what your instincts were telling you. There's no way in the world that you did not think, not even for a second, that this could be true. There's no way you couldn't have thought that. You or your sister. Both of them wanted to cover it up. No one wanted to even turn him in. They were mad. People in the neighborhood were angry and mad with Danielle because she did it. Well, this man told the detectives and his sister Danielle, I was crying out for help. I wanted someone to stop me. Danielle, I told you about my friend because I knew you would do the right thing. I knew you would eventually turn me in. You couldn't have known me. So Danielle and Maureen now absolutely having a strange relationship with each other. Maureen, when giving and talking about her brother, eventually did an interview herself, talking to, to the detectives. She wanted people to know that she hurts like the families hurt. So she began to cut herself while talking to the detectives, so much so, that they had to rush her to the emergency room and stitch her back up. 
She said this multiple times, but she's done it even after the fact. This is something that she has not been able to get over very quickly. And I say to the sister, we are not responsible for the things that our family do. You're not responsible for what um, another individual decides to do. I want to show you all a picture of Maureen. And what Maureen did to her legs. Oh. During this interview. I thought I had your picture up, but I don't. So I apologize. This is live and not memorized. Okay. Let me first just show you a picture of Maureen. This is Maureen, Richard's other sister, who lives now every day with the fact that there was, she felt like there was something she could do, but she couldn't do it. She again was ridiculed by many people. Now the stepfather, I mean the biological father was so grimy. Y'all wanna know how grimy he was? Richard, while being in jail, had done a confession letter. The stepfather, Rudolph, I mean, the biological father, Rudolph White, decided that he was going to sell the profession, copies of the confession to people for $35. $35. He said that the money he got from it he would build a fund for the kids who were harmed by the death of their parents, their moms. The town was so outraged with it that they asked them to put a stop to him selling that. All of the proceeds that he received from it, he said, now I'm going to take those proceeds and give them to my grand. This was a big thing in this little town in Colorado. Richard will never see the light of day. I'm hoping that his sisters can move on with their lives. Let me tell you something. If you think someone tells you information like that, that I've done this and I've done that, don't overlook it. I don't care how much that little boy has cried wolf. You investigate. You try to find out more. And absolutely don't aid in a bed a mother when you find out that they have committed some kind of Because you just might have to live with it. You might have to live with the guilt of it. Some people ain't going to understand your story. Especially when their loved one is gone. Especially when their loved one is gone. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I appreciate you all. This is my review of. Hey man, who on, what's your name? <laughs> Evil Lives Here, Season One, 
episode two, my brother's secret. Thank you so much to my moderators who always keep the chat nice and safe for everybody to talk. Please let me know down in the comment section what you think about this story. I've noticed that lately that there have been family members who have been going back on some of my reviews and making comments. And I want you to know to the family members who are making comments under my videos that I am only covering the story. I always know that there are two sides to every story, three sides, four sides, ten sides to every story. But I am only covering what it is that I see. And I know that many of you all are still in pain. And it's not my intention to cause you more. But I love mysteries. And I love talking about them. But it's never to hurt you. Thank you for leaving your comments, for helping me to understand your perspective on what has happened, hurt that you feel from your family members. Truly, we understand, and I definitely understand. I love you all to pieces. Y'all have a great night, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye, y'all.